Hey everyone, welcome to episode number 21 of the Mindful Hunter podcast. I'm your host as always, Jay Nickel. Super special episode this week. I was joined by Clay Lancaster, who's probably one of the most widely regarded sheep guides and just general big game guides in North America. My kind of primary goal was to pick his brain about aging and identifying mature rams as I'm getting ready for my first sheep hunt. You're going to be able to tell I was pretty excited to talk to to Clay. And the reason I'm kind of jumping in here with this intro is that I kind of glossed over a, an appropriate introduction of Clay and I didn't really set the context particularly well. So I wanted to give some background. Clay and his brother Jim are kind of like legends in in British Columbia with with what they've been able to do. I think Clay himself has participated in something in the neighborhood of 400 sheep harvests. Um, that number alone is just staggering. They run and own Nahani Butte Outfitters and uh, Copper River Outfitters. And Clay also runs an operation down in Mexico, sheep hunting during the winter. Uh, there's also uh, other Lancasters that are members of their family have different outfits across British Columbia and other places. They're kind of a bit of a they're a very well-known family in big game hunting across North America. And it was an honor for me to be able to talk to Clay. And I just, I want to, I want to thank him and really let him know that I appreciated the time for a guy who has done so much and is so well-known. He was super easy to talk to, super easy to get along with. Even like scheduling the call was easy. He was a super approachable guy. And it's just so cool when you have somebody who's done that much and is still willing to give back because he doesn't really have anything to gain by being on my podcast, but us, mainly me and and you guys who are listening to this have a lot to gain by him sharing what he knows. I think we can all be a little bit better hunters from it. I was really happy at the hour that came out of this. There's a ton of gems dropped throughout so, yeah, I just wanted to jump in, lay some context, give some background background on Clay, kind of who he is and and what he's done and why he's got some credibility in the space. So, I hope you enjoy the podcast. As always, if you want to get in touch with me, Jay at mindfulhunter.com on Instagram, it's mindful underscore hunter, and YouTube is mindful hunter. If you want to look up Clay and follow him on Instagram. It's Clay Lancaster underscore 300, spelt just like it sounds, C-L-A-Y-L-A-N-C-A-S-T-E-R. If you're curious about booking a hunt with Clay, you can just Google Lancaster Family Hunting, or you can go to Nahani Butte Outfitters, that's N-A-H-A-N-N-I-B-U-T-T-E, or Copper River Outfitters. I think Copper River might be run by his brother, Jim. We didn't really get into talking about that, but either way, if it's run by a Lancaster, you're going to have a, a good time. So thanks again to Clay. And I hope you guys enjoy this one. Here we go. Well, I'm looking at moving back to the Kootenays. That's where I was born and raised and kind of thinking of going back there now. You know, it's one of the only areas. So I was a forestry engineer for 15 years. So I've spent time, I lived on Haida Gwaii for three years. I've lived all over British Columbia, the islands up north, but I've never spent or I've never worked or hunted a whole lot in the Kootenays. So it's an area really? I still got to spend some time in. Yeah. Yeah. It's really, it's a cool, cool area down there. That's for sure. So I really enjoy it. And I'm a little partial, I guess, cause I was born there, but yeah, I anyway. hear, I hear lots of good things. Yeah, I know. It's really good. So what can I help you out with? Okay. So basically a little bit of context here. So I'm about, I'm about to do my first sheep hunt. I'd consider myself like a, a decent mountain hunter, uh, but I don't have any sheep hunting experience. I do all right on the YouTube and the podcast. It's, it's kind of growing and I kind of use it as an opportunity. Most of the guys who follow my stuff are kind of in the same boat as me, like late thirties, early forties kind of came into it in their early thirties or, or late twenties and didn't grow up with a whole, with guys to kind of really teach us. So what I try and do is just kind of educate as I'm kind of learning for myself. So you know what? I actually watched one of your shows just last week. You're kidding me. I, no, I got told to watch it and I watched the show with you doing a goat hunt. You didn't get the goat. Yeah, man. Um, that's my goat hunt. But yeah. I actually really enjoyed it. I was like, Hmm, 
Well, holy and shit. Oh, that's you great, have man. a very likable personality on camera. I was like, huh, this guy's kind of cool. Thanks a lot, man. So, that that means yeah. a lot coming from somebody like you. Yeah. Well, I don't even need to say much else. That's exactly what I try and do, man. I just try and keep it as real as possible. And sometimes I luck out and things go well. For me, I like getting out and getting back there and kind of getting after it. That's what kind of gets me excited. And, and if you're lucky enough to bring something home, great. And if you don't, well, you just got to go for next year. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Well, you know what? When you first get into hunting, until you really start to understand it and understand the animals and where you really should be going to, um, you and don't take this the wrong way. I'm not trying to sound like a pompous asshole, but um, you, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to go to the places that you think you need to go to, and you're going to realize that you know you spent a lot of time and a lot of energy in places that you shouldn't have wasted your time. But the best thing to do, which I was, what as I was impressed with, is you went and did it. You you earned it. Now you never got a goat, but you put your time in there. There's a lot of guys that capitalize on other people's knowledge and what they know and they they didn't ever learn it from the ground up and you don't learn it as well until you put your time in i don't feel anyway i couldn't agree more man the other thing that i've found is that once you've proven that you're willing to to go out there and get after it people are way more likely to be friendly like i've had more, more people reach out as a result of that goat film and be like listen man next year give me a call I got a spot or, you know, I, I do pretty yeah. well and I haven't, or the retired guys who are like, listen, I don't go it anymore. I'll, I'll give you a helping hand, but they only do that stuff. Cause you've proven that you're willing to do the effort first and you're not expecting a handout. And you're not complaining. That's the thing. Yeah. Too many guys come up to me because they know who I am. I mean, I've been on over 400 sheep now. <sighs> so I get guys all the time coming up to me and they're like, Hey, where can I go? What should I do? It's like, you know how I learned those spots? by walking right you want me to just hand them over and i made those mistakes as a young guy i told some friends about places then they were going back in there with their buddies and it's like you guys don't understand like a good spot that's sacrilege if somebody takes you to one of their spots you never go back there that's just an unwritten rule you never go back there and you think guys can get that figured out they just don't seem to understand it and you know, I went to a few spots hunting with guys that, hey, Clay, I'll show you where this is at. Go in there with them. We were successful. And I can tell you without a word of lie, I've never been back. Yeah. Unless they're with me, I don't go back. Now, I've said to a few guys, hey, that was friggin' awesome. Let's go back there again. And we've done that. But when it's their spot, you don't go back there. That's just, that's an unwritten rule. They put the boot leather in there to learn it. And you need to respect that. Yeah. That's about the only questions I don't respond to. I'll spend a lot of time with, like I said, I was lucky enough to be an engineer for 15 years. So like getting around in the mountains, I know like the back of my hand hunting, I've still got a lot to learn and I'm happy to admit that most of the stuff I help guys out with is like, you know, the survival stuff and the camping stuff and what boots to wear and stuff like that. And I'll spend hours with dudes when it's like that. But as soon as you get that, that what unit were you in or what trailhead was that? It's just like your heart just sinks. And it's like for Christ's sake, man. Like, come on. Like, yeah. Have uh, some respect. Go learn it yourself. Yeah. hundred percent. Okay. So this is actually going to lead almost perfectly into my first question because I found the sentiment out there right now is like, I want to get good at aging sheep so that I can have the greatest likelihood of killing the youngest legal sheep I, I possibly can. And I, I know that's not the way you think about things. And I, I think it's, hunters who give a shit, that's not the way we should be thinking about things, but you could, could you maybe share a little bit about the philosophy of the types of rams we should be looking for? Like we shouldn't use these aging skills as an excuse to shoot the youngest thing that fulfills the regs. No, you want to try to kill the oldest rams you possibly can. They're a sensitive species. They don't grow at a rate like mule deer or whitetail. They don't become a trophy animal really until they're hitting seven, eight years of age. You look at anything else out there, you're going to go shoot a moose. By three and four years of age, they're pretty impressive. Same with a mule deer, a whitetail. When you look at sheep, it takes them seven, eight years to start reaching maturity. And not just in physical maturity, but in their sexual maturity. They can try to breed, but if you have a proper, you know, working um, environment of, uh, of a sheep herd, those seven, eight-year-old rams are doing very, very little breeding. So the goal is... To try to kill your 10, 11, 12-year-old type sheep to preserve your sheep herd. Also, the big mistake that's been made a lot in BC and different places is guys are going in there killing all the old age rams out of a place. And that's dangerous because now what do you have that's going to take those young rams when you get that questionable winter, you know, the deep snow levels? 
you know, uh, lots of spring rains. There's places that those sheep know where to go to because they've lived for 10, 11, 12 years that they can take those younger rams, those four, five, six-year-olds, teach it to them and give them a place to go to so they can get out of it. And I found places where all of a sudden, you know, you'll find an old avalanche and there'll be five, six rams buried in the bottom of the avalanche. You're like, oh, that's kind of weird. And then when you get looking at it and you realize that every sheep in there is four, three, four, five years old, and you're like, there was no old ram that didn't teach him, hey, don't come here. We need to go somewhere else. And that can sound kind of crazy to some people. They're like, oh, they're not that smart, but they are. Right. And those are the kind of things, that's the reasons why we need to be paying attention to it. And not to mention, you want those prime breeding rams, the eight, nine, you know, and even 10-year-old rams. But that eight and nine is prime, prime breeding years. 10-year-old is still a good breeding ram. Um, so let's harvest those rams that are 11, 12, 13 years old. And unfortunately, a lot of our regulations don't even allow us to do that anymore. And I think it's really sad, not to mention a lot of biologists in this province and guys that are head in departments that have no idea how to age a sheep. They're so far out to lunch, it's not even funny. And it's frustrating because I've seen some resident guys put in a lot of time and effort and then turn around and have their sheep seized because uh, some idiot doesn't know how to age a sheep properly. Right. And they've done everything right. And it's like, you got to reward that guy, not punish him. So remembering what it was like to be a young guy, what are some, like, what would you say? And I mean, I, I'm, I'm listening here just as much as the other guys. Are there any pieces of advice you'd give or even tips? Cause you know what it's like, man, you, you get out there and the first piece of antler or horn, you see the heart starts beating, you get excited and you just want to put something on the ground. Cause, cause you're new at this and it's exciting. What types of things would you say to guys like, like that and myself to kind of help us prepare for that and the willingness to put the time in and the willingness to walk away. Okay. And need to you need to be honest with yourself. And what I mean by that is when you start looking at a ram, you're trying to identify them, what are they, what are they, don't talk yourself into it. If you're looking at that sheep and your first impression of that ram, which 90% of the time is usually right, and your first impression is he's seven years old, don't try to talk yourself into another ring. Don't try to talk yourself into two more rings. Be honest and go, you know what, that sheep's only seven years old. And I really shouldn't shoot it. Yep. Now you can, and he might be legal to curl and everything else. And the majority of people out there aren't going to say, I'm not going to say anything. If it's your first ram, you kill it. And it's a seven year old ram. I'm not going to say shit about it. Our six year old ram. I'm still not going to say shit about it. But if you're that guy that's been on three sheep hunts, you managed to kill three rams and they're all six year old rams or all seven year old rams. I'm not impressed with you. Not even a little bit. In fact, I think you're kind of useless. That's my opinion. So put the effort and try to find those older mature rams. If you're, if you're going to take the time to do this, then you owe it to the animal. And that's the big thing that drives me crazy is so many guys just think that this, this whole hunting thing is it's their right, it's their right, it's their right. It's, it's not your right to disrupt Mother Nature like that. It's a privilege to be able to be out there and do that. And when you get out there in those sheep herds, you, you owe it to them to put your best foot forward. And I noticed when you were doing things, you got yourself in shape. Now, you went completely the opposite way that most guys do which <laughs> I found kind of interesting, the fact that you went up in weight instead of down in weight. But hey, I mean, to each their own, to whatever a guy thinks his goals are and his aspirations, I don't question anybody for that. Um, I got to think you found it a whole lot harder to pack all that muscle around the hills than what you did when you were lighter though. Oh, 100%. And listen, I'm, I, I, won't, I won't beat around the bush. I kind of had this goal. I hit my 40s and I'm like, I want to do a bodybuilding show. And I knew immediately this is counterproductive to backcountry hunting, but I'm also, yeah. you know, like the, like the song says, if you're going to dump, be dumb, you better be tough. And I, I kind of saw it as a bit of a challenge and I'm kind of, I'm, I'm down in weight 10 pounds now from the, I learned a lot from the goat hunt and having this sheep hunt come up. I was like, I'm, I'm not hitting the mountains that heavy again. Uh, you know, I pushed through it. Luckily I got a bit of grit. Um, and I do, I, I, I take things seriously. That's another thing. I think you owe the mountains that respect too. Like so many guys I see that are like, oh, it'll be fine. I'll figure it out. And it's like, you won't figure it out, man. You're going to break mentally. No. You're going to turn around and go home. And like that week or 10 days you took off work is like, you're going to be embarrassed to talk about. And it's like, you only get one shot at that. And I think you need to remember this 10%, I'm sorry, 90% of the sheep are killed by 10% of the hunters. Right. And what I mean by that is, the guys out there that kill rams, even if they don't kill the ram themselves, they're helping their buddies to kill the ram. Right. And that's what you see going on out there because those guys know how to push. Those guys know how to pace. Those guys know how to freaking 
Go to the next hillside. Look in that next valley. Look at that end ridge. Look down low where other people aren't going to look. So those are the guys that kill the sheep. Those are the guys that help their buddies to kill sheep. When you take an average person that's going out for their first time sheep hunting, ultimately, I'm going to say it, they're probably going to be unsuccessful. Right. There's very few guys. And the guys that seem to do it are those lean, mean, raw bone guys that just go, 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 go. And you know what? They probably walked past way more sheep than they seen. Hmm. But they just went enough that they bumped onto something eventually. Like their paths are going to cross something. Right. But it doesn't happen every year like that. I've seen those guys that go, 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 go. Once time they get it. Next time they don't see shit. Next time they don't see shit. Next time they get one. You know, and it's like you guys are doing a whole bunch more work that you don't need to be doing. But, you know, it's your call. If that's the way you want to hunt, go hunt that way. I As I'm getting older, I always say to everybody, I'm hunting way smarter now than I ever have before. Right. And it makes such a big difference. So, okay. So let, let's talk a little bit more technical now. And you were the first guy that I, I don't know where the crown method came from. You were the first guy I saw that talked about it before I saw your stuff on it. I had always heard just people talking, you know, it's funny how many sheep videos I've seen. It's gotta be in in over a hundred. And I'm talking like, you know, the big, you know, so-called YouTube influencer guys, and even like the legit guys, you see them debate the full curl thing all day. Like, are we breaking the nose or if it's a big horn, are we breaking that eye line? But I've never heard anybody, uh, you know, talk about this, the crown method and the way you described it. I'm just really shocked. I don't hear about it more. Could you kind of, and I know it's going to be tough because we don't have like a visual. And what I'll do is I'll link in the show notes for people who listen to this to some video on it or some pictures so that people can get it. But can you talk a little bit about just that as an aging method? And let's keep the conversation to thin horns because that's kind of what most of us here in BC are going to be focused on with over-the-counter tags. So you're talking about thin horns right now? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's really simple method. Everybody tries to make it out to be so complicated, but it's not. I mean, you literally go straight back of the eye and then straight above the eye on the back side. So you got a 90 degree plane in there and you go right to the back side of the eye, go straight up. And usually you end up about two and a half to three inches up the outer circumference. And that's the key. Don't look at the inner side. Just look at the outer circumference of the horn. When you look at that outer circumference, you end up two and a half, three inches up. Then you look at your other line that runs straight back from the eye, kind of from the bottom part of the nostril, straight back from the eye, straight back. So you're, yeah, just slightly below the bottom of the eye socket. So then you form a 90 degree angle in that area there that's called the crown. Here, I'm in kind of a shitty cell coverage place here, but I'll just keep talking. Okay. Can you still hear me all right? Yeah, I got you so far. I'll let you know if you drop out. So anyway, um, inside that area right there, you want to have that the back one, the first one that you go to the, the back, you want to have it so that the very back part on the outer ridge of the horn is kind of kicking up a little bit, not pointing down. If it's pointing down, you're looking at the wrong annuli, but you want that one that's straight back. Usually that's your fourth year. And the fourth year, for some reason, is always the most predominant annuli on a horn. It's the easiest to see all the time. And the fifth is awful close too. Okay. So when I go straight back, I'll hit that fourth year. And now I want to count myself going forward back towards the front base part of the horn. When I hit that point, that's two and a half to three inches up and straight up from the backside of that eye socket, whatever I have in that area right there is what I'm looking at. If I got three in that area, the ram is six or seven years of age. And he's six or seven because I have my three out to the end and I'm going to have the three that I have. I may or may not have one between where I'm at and the base of the horn. Right. Get one there. He's seven. If I have four in that crown, which is the big ticket part, that's what you're looking for. If you have four in the crown, you're always going to have one more in the base and you'll have three out at the end. Sometimes you have two in the base. So if you got four in the crown, you've always got those extra two. I mean, one or two in the, in the front part and three in the end, which is going to give you eight or nine years of age. Right. Five in the crown, exact same principle. Now you're hitting a 10 or 11 year old round. Six in the crown, 12 or 13 year old round. And it works on desert sheep. Doll sheep, stone sheep, bighorn sheep, Marco Polo sheep, Altair Gully sheep. You pick the sheep, it works. Okay. As long as they're a full curl type ram, that system works flawlessly. So one of the things that I heard you mention on one of your videos is the, one of the best ways to decipher a false annuli is that it won't kind of break the edge of the, of the, like it won't curve over the horn. Like you might see a pretty, 
you know, strong looking false antelope. See it on run the, into the horn, but you yeah. got you always got that little bit of an outside ridge on the very outside part of the horn. Right. You don't see that thing cut into the horn. When you're looking at it, it can be prominent looking. Like you, you can sit there and look at it and go, oh yeah, it's very prominent looking. But prominent looking and actually cutting into the horn are two different things. Now it cuts into the horn for one reason and one reason only. The blood supply ends. Usually you're sitting there and they get done feeding and start getting some snowfall and colder weather and you're in October. And it doesn't matter which thing you're trying to hunt there for the, you know, the, the northern species of sheep. You start running into October, they start putting all their energy, all their protein into their body right. and not in their horns anymore. So that cuts the blood supply off that's going to that horn. When you cut off that blood supply, it causes an indenture on the horn that cuts all the way through and just seals it off. And I mean, as soon as you get that, that's what forms an annuli. I mean, you look at a false annuli, if you have a really, really bad snowstorm or rainstorm or something like that, that pops up in the middle, like sometimes you're up North and you hear these guys talking about, well, you remember two years ago, all the guys were talking about the the huge snowstorms up there. You're going to see that false annuli in every single ram for the next 12 to 13 years that gets killed. You'll be able to look at it and go, Hey, there's that bad snowstorm they had in Northern BC right there. Because those sheep, when you dump three feet of snow, they revert automatically. All the blood supply goes into their body, preserving their body and not going to their horn growth. So you're going to see that for years to come. And you're going to see a lot of sheep that are going to have lost a lot of growth that year because when it seals off, it has a harder time coming back on again. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. So you're really looking at for it to cut through the edge. And that's kind of your indicator of whether or not it's false. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. 110%. And the next thing to look for is... Unless a sheep breaks a leg or busts a horn core or does something really weird, his annuli are going to be what I call progressive, where you're going to see the normal growth patterns of a sheep. And that's your first baby lamb year is a little tiny thing. Your second year growth is a a good size growth. Your third and your fourth years are great years. Fifth year is a great year. And then from your sixth on down, they start getting bigger bases and start getting a little bit shorter in length, but they start getting a bigger circumference to them. And, you know, then you'll see that where the next year, year seven, not near as much length as what they had in, in four and five, and definitely a lot bigger around the circumference. And it keeps doing that. And you'll see that natural progression that goes really big and then shorter, 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 shorter. And that's what they do. Like they'll put more of their growth into the base. And they do that because the base is what gives them that ability to hit the head. So when they're hitting heads, they're stepping back and hitting each other at 20 miles a, a pop, each guy flying at each other. They need more weight in that head, more weight to, to be around that core. They don't need that weight around there when they're two, three, and four years of age because when they're fighting, they barely even hitting heads. They're not getting in that prime breeding. They don't have that huge body weight behind them. They don't need that massive heaviness around that core so the core doesn't break. As they start getting and going, hey, I'm going to be a prime breeding ram, that's when the, it goes away from length and it goes more into the circumference and the girth. And that's what allows those sheep to hit heads the way they do. That makes a lot of sense. And I, I was going to get into this later on, but this makes a, this is a good point to talk about this because I think this kind of dovetails with that point. Can you discuss the, the kind of importance of a Roman nose when you're looking for like that older, really actually mature ram? So what happens is most sheep, on a healthy population, if they're not a prime breeding ram, usually they're going to start their breeding season in their seventh year. So that's when they really say, hey, I'm going to hit your head this year. I'm going to fight you. I'm going to try to take over this, this herd of use. So then they start hitting hard. And that's the year in November when they actually start hitting heads hard for the first time. So typically, and again, this is no 100% because you can get a great big bodied ram that you know, he starts becoming a prime breeder at six. That can happen. There's parts of region um, seven where you'll see the herds are, are typically like that, where they don't live a long, long time and they become prime breeding rams at five, six, seven years of age. So that all contributes though to why they don't live a long time. But I'll get into that part in a second. But what you see typically is a seven-year-old ram starts to become a prime breeder. So you'll see that he'll actually go from a nice narrow looking nose and everything to a broken, wider, broader nose as an eight-year-old ram. When you see them, which is in the spring, in the summertime, in the fall, when he's an eight-year-old ram. And he just looks more mature. His nose is just a little bit wider. When you look at it from the side, it's broken just a little bit. All of a sudden, when he hits nine and ten, he's had two or three hard seasons of that. Now, when you look at him from the front, he's got a really wide, wide base nose all the way down. When you look at it from the side, it goes down about the halfway mark. It just breaks right off. And then it goes down and then kind of kicks out again. 
So it becomes a lot more prominent once they start hitting nine and 10 years of age. But an eight-year-old will have it. Nine-year-old, 10-year-old going to have huge Roman noses on them. Anything past nine, 10, you're not really, when you're looking at the Roman nose, it's not going to really tell you a whole lot other than they're a big old mature ram. Right. Okay. Um, do you ever take pictures with a phone scope or would you recommend that as a tactic for, for younger hunters in order so that you can actually sit down and look at it for a little while if the sheep's moving around or do you prefer in this day and age, if you're not using a phone scope or your camera or something to take pictures through the spot and scope, you're a fool. Okay. You need to be doing it. You need to analyze them. If you have time, you need to be looking at it. Now that being said, once you get better with this, you literally can poke your head over a hill with a pair of binoculars at 200 yards and go one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Yeah, kill that ram on the right. You can do it that fast. Right. But it takes time. It takes every single time you look at a picture in a book, you go one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. And it takes being honest going one, two, three, one, two, that, that one's only got three. So those are, those are things that you definitely got to be aware of. You definitely got to pay attention to. Um, but it definitely makes a big difference if you have that phone scope there, because you can sit there and count it. One time when I was hunting stone sheep, I got into this place that I seen these rams from the other side of this lake. I come all the way around the lake and it was real thick timber. And I was on this little bluff and I'm like, I know we went up by this bluff somewhere. So I'm sitting there with the guy with me and we're listening and we're looking and we're listening and we're looking. And all of a sudden, literally I could hear crunching and it sounded like it's coming by my feet. And I lean out just a little bit and I could just see the ass end of a sheep. I'm talking 15 feet underneath me. And we'd been whispering going, I know they got to be here somewhere. <laughs> so this ram is right underneath me. Well, I can't see him. So what I do is I end up taking my video camera and I leaned it out over top of the cliff. And I hung on the guy's hand and I just filmed it. I just held it out there and filmed. And then I end up stopping it, rewinding it watching it, pausing it on my screen, my flip out screen. Yeah. I went one, two, three, four, five, six. <laughs> I'm like, this is an ancient old Ram. Awesome. We're good to go. So I can't see the sheep anymore, but I don't need to see them anymore. Right. So then I grabbed the guy's buckle on his pants and I'm like, turn around, lean out over that cliff as far as you can. I'm going to hang on to you and shoot the Ram. Too He's much. like, this is nuts. So he literally leaned out 15 feet. I got him in one hand. I got the video camera in the other hand and I filmed the whole hunt. And he shoots a giant ram right underneath us. And it's absolutely incredible footage. That's amazing. So, That's hilarious. Okay. So the answer is yes, absolutely. Use the tools yes, you got. Definitely yeah, do it. If you're not using sure. it, you need to be. So now is there any behaviors like when you're looking at a, let's say you're, you're, you're too far off to really get a good look at, at rings or anything. Are there specific behaviors that you will see a ram do that you like he's a boss ram and you know it's worth us walking another couple miles over there to have a second look because the way they're kind of behaving they're not just a bunch of ewes and lambs for example well the first thing that i always look for when you're looking long distance and heat waves and everything else is do you have some horn on top of the head you can see that great that's step one okay sometimes when you're looking that far you can't really differentiate what the roman nose even looks like so you look at that and you're like well, it looks like he's got a Roman nose, but you can't see much else. So the next thing that I look for is the is his body stature. When I look at that ram in the heat waves and stuff from a long distance away, when he's standing broadside, is his back swayed or is it poker straight? Meaning, is it, does it, when it goes from his shoulder to his ass, does it go poker straight all the way back? Or do I actually see a sway to his back? Because if it's poker straight, I'm usually dealing with a seven, eight-year-old ram. They don't yeah. start to get a sway back at all until he hit nine years of age. Okay. And it don't matter where you're hunting at or how you're doing it. That's just the way it is. It takes them nine years before they start to get a suede back. Now, when I, when I look at that and I, I see that real prominent, noticeable suede back, you'll see it a little bit in eight-year-old rams, but it's not prominent. And you definitely won't see a big pot belly on them. But you'll see a little bit of a suede back in eight-year-old. Nine-year-old's going to have a suede back and a pot belly. A 10-year-old's going to have a suede back and a really big, noticeable pot belly. And then an 11-year-old, He's actually going to gaunt up in the hips, have a big suede back to him, and a huge pot belly. So okay. those are things that I look for. Then my next movement that I make is I watch how everything else, I got to say, what sheep am I trying to look for? There's six, seven rams in a group. You know, and you spend all your time going back, forth, back, forth, back, forth, back, forth, back, forth. No, don't do that. Quit wasting your time with a bunch of other ones. Usually you can identify it's a quarter curl or whatever. Quit looking at them. Don't even bother looking at them again. It doesn't matter. Other than to know how many sheep are in that band. But the next thing you got to identify with that is, 
okay, who's the last ram to get up? Because most times that old boss ram is the last sheep to get up. And a lot of times he's the first sheep or the second sheep to lay down. Next, if you're watching a bunch of sheep laying down and all of a sudden one gets up and he walks over and they nut kick each other all the time. <laughs> and you see the one that walks up and he'll just nut kick anybody else out of the bed and take that bed. Watch that ram. All right. That's usually your big ram. <clears throat> so if you're sitting there trying to get that one, you know, two second look where the heat waves kind of clear. You want to be looking at the ram that kicked the other ram in the nuts and got him out of there. You want to be looking at that ram that when he laid down, all the other sheep will lay with their heads in different directions and they will not look at him because if they look at him, he'll get up and hammer them. So they literally have that kind of respect that it's a natural hierarchy thing, but it also saves their life by that lead ram. He's the boss. He lays down. All those other rams will come up and you'll watch them. They'll look out of the corner of their eye to see what he's doing. Huh. But they will not look directly at him ever. Huh. When I start seeing those other sheep doing that, I go, okay, that's the sheep I got to be watching right there. Gotcha. So then I put my time in and I'm watching, watching. All of a sudden, you know, you get a little breeze comes in. It gets a little bit cooler. Yeah. You get that two, three second window where all of a sudden everything's just perfectly clear in the middle of the day. It's like, oh shit. And now I see three quarters of horn coming around on him. I'm like, that's the ram right there. That's the ram we got to be paying attention to. He stands up. I see he's got a sway back to him. I see he's got a pot belly. Looks like he's got a Roman nose. It's like, boys, we got one here. We got to get going here. Right. This is worth going to look at. Now, I don't mean he's going to be legal, but he's going to have age to him every time. Okay. That makes a lot of sense. Can you talk a little bit about one of the tricky elements of our regulations, as far as I understand it, is that in order for a ram to be considered full, full curl, it has to break the plane of the nose. But if it has too much curl to it and starts going back towards the eye, even though technically that's a full curl ram, they would take that ram as far as I and understand it. And they've done it. that before. And why they don't change that is beyond me. It's absolutely fucking asinine. And that's the only way to describe it. Okay. I've seen 10 year old rams that come all the way around and they're two to three inches into the other part of the horn and kicking out sideways. And they've been seized on guys. And it's like, wait a minute, he's 10 years old. Okay. We'll give him back. But you can take some seven year old twister and he gets seized. And it's like, that doesn't make any sense. Cause that actually, if it comes all the way back, never mind the bridge of the plane nose, full curl, just that definition in itself, full curl. Yeah. If the curl is completed, why is that not legal? It makes no sense. Why do you have to have it come to the bridge of the nose? Sure. Either come to the bridge of the nose or go into the horn so it makes a complete circle of the horn. If it's actually going back up into the horn again, full curl. I mean, how much more do you need to do? And for anybody that takes and seizes around like that, I have zero respect for them because it makes no sense. That's just being an asshole as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, I mean, I agree. I think it was just a, an important thing to mention because when I when I heard you mention it on one of your on one of your videos, I was like, oh shit, that's something I want to pay attention to because if uh, I would have just thought, you know it's a full curl. Like it goes in a complete circle. So by definition, I would have thought of that as a full curl, but I could see how, and obviously I, I think you really want to, that's why I like this four in the crown and looking for the age first and almost using the curl as kind of the backup as opposed to. See, and, and there's another thing I'll recommend with counting crown. And I'll say this to a lot of people, but if you're shooting a ram that's a broomed off ram in this day and age, the way that some of these game departments are, if you're looking at that ram, and you start counting, and he's broomed off, and it looks like he's got the first year, and he's broomed all the way to the second year and everything else. If you don't see eight visible annuli that you know are there, don't shoot them. Okay. Let that ram go to become a nine-year-old okay. ram then. Because if you're only looking at seven visible annuli, don't shoot them. Right. I think, my own opinion, they should change the regulation to that. Must have. And it's going to eliminate all kinds of problems for everybody. Instead of trying to guess what we're looking at. And this was actually, this whole plan actually came forward by a conservation officer in Kamloops. And I 110% agree with them. Eight visible annuli and away you go. Now, can you still use this method to count eight invisible annuli? Absolutely. No reason why you can't. But if you're sitting there and you got a broom ram and you're counting four, but you just, oh, maybe I got a year missing there. And, you know, you're kind of in question. You start to doubt yourself a little bit. I have a very simple, simple thing that I've said my entire life when it comes to sheep hunting. When in doubt, walk away. And that's where you owe it to yourself. You owe it to the sheep. You owe it to the rest of the hunters out there that if you're in doubt at all, walk away from it. I know some guys that went hunting this year that they came back, they showed me the pictures 
And they had three or four eight-year-old rams that they could have shot, but they just weren't a hundred percent confident on it. Yep. And then they got looking at them and they're like, ah, I don't think it's there. It's not what we're looking for. You know, we're trying to kill something 10 years of age and they walked away. And I'll tell you what, I admire them guys. And I got a feeling that those guys are going to get payback tenfold. Right. Because of the fact that they walked away, I don't know. I believe in that karma. I believe in mother nature coming your way and it, they'll come back around and those guys will end up killing big sheep because of it. And then they didn't shoot something that was questionable. If it was questionable in their mind, they walked away. You know what? I took my hat off to them. I said, you know what, guys, that's unreal. And since I started doing these, I mean, there's a lot of outfitters out there that, you know, they get mad and they get pissed off. Oh, you know, residents are killing this and are killing that. Well, if you're not going to do anything to try to help people out, then you don't really have a right to bitch about it. Right. Yes, it influences your what you're getting on, on your quota. I totally understand that, but try to help guys out. And I'm not saying take guys out. I'm not saying teach them how to sheep hunt, but I am saying teach them how to friggin' age sheep. Tell them, you know, this is what to look for in older mature rams. And if they start making conscious awareness, and I probably had in the last four or five years now, I'm probably up to 120 pictures that I've had guys send me that have said, Hey, Clay, you know, after reading what you put, after taking that one um, seminar that you did here, that workshop that you did over here, I looked at this, I looked at this ram and I think he's seven years old. And I'll look at those pictures. And I'm like, you were right. Instead of those guys shooting those sheep, they walked away from it. Yep. When I sit there and I look at it, I'm like, you know what? That's what we need to be doing. As far as an outfitter goes, if there's an outfitter out there and he knows this kind of stuff, which a lot of them do, a lot of them don't mind you, but a lot of them do. They, they need to pass that kind of knowledge on to people. And it, the sheep hunting world is a funny world because what people learn, they don't want to tell anybody else about. I mean, they keep tight-lipped and hush-hush. Well, you know what? Keep your spots. I get that part. But try to help guys out so they're not making mistakes. If that guy comes back with a six-year-old ram and you could have said something to help him out, then I think the onus is kind of on you too because you didn't say anything to him. You didn't, didn't try to teach him. And that's why I make as much information. I try to make time for as many people as I can to try to show them this. Because I think if everybody keeps passing this information on, then there's going to be a conscious movement about, hey, guys, let's not shoot these younger questionable rams. Let's look at these more mature 9, 10, 11, 12-year-old rams. And it's going to help all of us out. Not just the outfitters, not just the resident hunter, but it's going to help the herd out, which should be all of our first and primary goal. Yeah, and I think we're in a bit of a different era now. Like, you know, 15, 20 years ago, the guys who hunted were the guys who grew up hunting. And nowadays yeah. that's not the case. And you have guys like myself who are, you know, best intentions. We're trying to do the best job we can, but we just simply didn't, we weren't born into this. And if it wasn't for guys like yourself and a few others putting out, you know, quality information, we'd be stumbling around out there like, like idiots and making mistakes. And those mistakes hurt the hunting population as a whole, not just the individual who, who makes them. So I do think the tide is turning to us to a certain degree. And I think you know, as long as you go about it the right way and the respectful way, there's a lot of guys with good information that's, that's willing to share it. It's just, it's an etiquette thing too, with the younger guys. They just, there's a right way and a wrong way to ask for help. Well, and I think a lot of guys went out there and their first thing was, I just want to get one. I just want to get one. I just want to get one. I don't care. I don't care. I don't care. Yeah. yeah. But now there seems to be a real <clears throat> conscious awareness of, Hey, this is a privilege. If you're going to do it and you want respect from these other guys that have been doing it their whole lives, then educate yourself. If you don't take the time to educate yourself, people are looking at it and going, hey, man, that wasn't cool. Like you shot a six-year-old sheep. You shouldn't have done that. You should have walked away. So now there's starting to be a pressure coming from other hunters that are saying, hey, it's not okay to sit there and say, oh, I didn't know. I, I couldn't age it. I didn't. No, there's definitely a bunch of people with podcasts and the internet and everything that's available out there. If you're not educating yourself on this, then you probably shouldn't be doing it. You know, stick to going and hunting a white-tailed deer somewhere or something. Don't go up in the mountains and, and go shoot some five-year-old ram because, oh, that's what I wanted to do. And even more frustrating to me is when I see a lot of these special draw areas. Oh. And somebody draws a special draw area and they come out of there with a three- or four-year-old ram. It's like, ask for help. Yeah. Don't sit there and let your pride get in the way. Ask somebody out there and say, hey, do you know somebody that knows something about sheep hunting? Because, again, I come back to that same thing. 90% of the rams are killed by 10% of the hunters. But you can learn from them 10 guys. They'll help you out. If it's a special tag in a draw area that nobody can even hunt in, there's tons of us out there that you call us up. I've done it a few times where, hey, yeah, you need hand, I'll come there. And I went over, helped guys out, got them all lined out, got them on the right sheep. They kill an old mature ram. Everybody's happy. It was worth it. 
Yeah, for sure. Listen, I want to, I want to be respectful of your time, but I, I threw up a bit of a Q and a here and I got, you know, maybe three or four technical questions just about sheep hunting in general. Would you be all right if we just kind of fire through those quickly? Yeah, no problem. Okay. So let's talk optics for, for a second. So me personally, I'm going in with some Zeiss tens and a Zeiss 95 millimeter. And the question I'm trying to answer is, should I bring my Swaro 15s as well? And I realize that's a lot of weight to carry and maybe you could just be more general, but what's the ideal optics setup? And let's assume you got a couple bucks. What, what's, what's your ideal optics setup for, for sheep hunting? Hey, I'm different than a lot of people out there. I spent years and years and years and years with eights. Huh. And people sit there and say, you hunted with eights? And I'm like, yeah, I still have them. My dad bought me a pair of 832 Swaros when I was 15 years old. I think he paid 450 bucks for them. I still have those binoculars. <laughs> That's crazy. And from the day that he handed them to me, I thought that they were the closest thing that I could have had in my hands since gold. Right, right. And I treated them with so much respect. It wasn't even funny. And they worked amazing for me. Now, what helps you out? Hey, if you're young, it's no big deal. The eyes haven't got old yet. You haven't hit 40. You know, using a pair of eight powers, no problem at all. But I started switching. You know, as I got a little bit older, I started switching to tens. But I always have a simple philosophy. Where are you hunting from and what are you doing? If you're backpacking in somewhere and you're going way the heck in there, I don't like the weight on my neck. I hate it. If I got to do miles and miles and miles, yeah. because I've been in quite a few wrecks in my life, it starts pulling on my neck. I don't care whether there's bino buddies are on there or what you have for harnesses. It just, I don't like the weight on my neck. So I actually go with a very light pair of 1032 Swaros. Okay. And I find them to be the greatest backpacking binocular that there is. Now, when I get in there, the one thing I don't go without is I go with an unbelievable spotting scope all the time. Right now, what I've been running the last three, four years is a Swaro 85. Yep. I love that thing. Like, to me, that's the best all-around scope there is. Weight, if you got to go the weight compared to what you're gaining, you know, the objective lens, or the heat waves, you put it all together. Now, if I'm, if I'm going to be from a truck or something like that, hey, go big. Go as big as you can. When I'm in Mexico hunting desert sheep, I got these 12 um, 50s that I'm using of Swarovski that are out of this world. Like, to say they're clear is just an understatement. They weigh a ton. I love spotting with them. I can spot for hours and hours and hours with them. I use my walking stick. I got a little attachment that I put on there and just lean with my head against that, prop it up, and I just go for hours with it. Love it. But if I'm going in the backcountry and I'm going way in there, I don't want the weight on my neck. And I'm trying to lighten my pack with everything I can. When I have my pack packed right now with my rifle, my camera equipment, everything, and I'm doing a 10 day trip, I'm right at 50 pounds. Cool. Now is that food or goes, no? Yeah, food and everything. No shit. Now, I make a ton of my own food and I don't eat as much as the average person does. And I okay. think it's, I've just gotten older and I've cut my calorie intake down a bunch and I've found that to, uh, to definitely help me out. Now, what I do go without more than anything is not so much the food end of it is I don't go with a whole bunch of extra gear that I don't need. Right. I don't mind roughing it a little bit. And I've seen guys, you know, where I look in their bag and they got three pairs of pants with them and two pairs of long johns. And I'm like, dry it out, yep. get a fire going, hang it in the wind, whatever. But that's the kind of stuff I go without. My layers is I'll go with a really, really like almost like running Lyrica kind of uh, long johns. Yep. Then I'll have my whatever my pair of pants is, I'll make that like a medium weight. And then I don't take anything else. I don't even have rain pants with me. And guys are like, how do you not have rain pants? Well, I'm always using jackets and stuff that are longer. And okay. I like a longer jacket that goes down and covers my knee, right almost to my knee. And yeah. then I'll put my gaiters on. So my rain gear is gaiters and having a jacket that goes to my knee. So the only thing that's really exposed all the time is my actual knees. But I eliminate a ton of weight by doing that. You know, I don't need to pack three or four pairs of pants with me. Yeah. And if I get cold out, I throw that pair of long johns underneath. Now, if I'm getting really late season, I will throw like a, a really light pair of down pants or something that I can just pull over top everything for when I'm glassing and everything like that. But that's only on a few trips. Then I'll get up to about 55 pounds because I'll usually have some kind of a, a little bit heavier, puffy and some puffy pants with me. So... Man, I was 81 pounds with rifle on that goat hunt. What a fucking pack that was. And that's... But you, you were hunting wintertime. Wintertime's a little bit different scenario. Yeah, I learned so, a lot on that one in my head because I've always been a, like, I'll just carry whatever I kill and my camp out. And I, that hunt made me realize 
if you want to go in deep like that for goat, there's just, you're doing two trips. There's, there's just, it's physically impossible to take enough food and gear to be safe for a week long hunt and still come out with an animal on your back. And that was a big takeaway for me because that's not the plan that I went in there with. But after I was walking out after a week, I was like, there's no way I'd be putting a full goat on this pack right now. And especially no. like not in that deep snow too. And my snowshoes were so beat to shit. Like it was just, it wouldn't have happened. Well, I can tell you this much in the trips that I've done when we went in stone sheep hunting um, with buddies and you go in there and you kill a ram. If you're not, it should be two guys per ram, but okay. if you're not, you need to be prepared to be packing 125 pounds. Okay. You absolutely have to be when you're coming out of there. Yep. And the times that I've done it, I've weighed packs when I've come out of the mountains. I've had packs that have went from 125 to 135 pounds. And people are like, you can't pack that. Well, this much I can tell you. You can pack it, but you can do about 20 to 25 minutes maximum. Yep. And then you got to stop and get that pack off your shoulders. Because yep. your arms are numb. You can't lift them anymore. Circulation's gone out of them. And I don't care what you're using for a pack. That's just the way it goes. It will just pull on you to that point that you don't want to go anymore, that you need to stop because your arms are hurting, your shoulders are hurting. So you set that thing down and you sit down, you wait, run your arms in circles, get your circulation going back again so you're feeling halfway decent. Then you shoulder that pack, you throw everything on, and you're gone again for, you know, 20, 25 minutes. That's yeah. what you're going to get out of it. Then they're going to say, oh, yeah, I can do more than that. I packed 150, I packed 180. Not for any serious distance you didn't. I mean, I've done those kind of packs. I've packed 200, 220, 230 pounds. You know, if I'm packing a moose quarter down to a river or something like that, that's one thing. But when you're doing miles and miles, and I mean, it, where it's going to be taking you two to three days to get out of somewhere, no, you start running 125 pounds, you got a hell of a load on. Yeah. That's why my, I tell guys, two guys, one sheet. Yeah. My goal is a 60 pound pack because that was kind of the math I had. I know I can. And I'm a bigger dude too. Like uh, yeah. I, I, I can walk around pretty decent with 120, 125. Shit starts falling apart. And even that, like I, I, I got an elk solo before and I've done some solo mule deer that like, I was pretty fucked up for a couple of weeks afterwards. You know, like you're getting weird twinges yeah. in your neck and stuff like that. Like you, you pay a price to get those types of loads out, you know? So I, I like that number though, 125. And I think force and breaks too. It's like one of those things you just don't want to stop, but you got to think of it. You got to think of the hike out as like one big thing that you're trying to be as efficient with as possible. And sometimes going further is not going faster and you're better off to take more frequent breaks and stay a bit fresher. Yeah. And I do find this too. If you have a bigger guy like yourself, like I went around around 240 for a long time. I was yep. a, I'm a big guy. And I can tell you that I could pack a heavier load than most other guys, especially those guys that, you know, the long mean guys that are one, uh, 170, 175 pounds that can really go like crazy. Yeah. They're going to beat me to the top of the mountain, but after seven, eight, nine, ten 10 days, I'm still going at my pace and they're way behind. Right. So it's harder on those guys. They don't have the, the reserves and you definitely don't have that, that really good ability to pack those heavy, heavy loads for long, long time periods. Now I've lightened up a bunch. I'm down to 200 now. And I noticed in Mexico, my speed was so much better this year than it has been in the past. My endurance was way better. I could definitely go way faster and stuff, but I definitely couldn't pack as big a loads this year as I usually do. And there was a few times I looked at some of the other guys with me and I'm like, here, take some of this. They're like, well, you always pack it all the time. I'm like, yeah, I'm not packing it all anymore. One, I'm almost 50 <laughs> years of age. And two, you guys are packing some of it now. Yeah, I'm not sitting there trying to show off to anybody anymore. I'm done with all that. Like, I'm getting to be the old guy in the group all the time when my clients and my guides and everybody are younger than me. It's like, no, you guys pack some of this. I don't need to pack it all. Yeah. So, Do you have any tips for tent condensation? <laughs> Hold your breath. <laughs> <laughs> the best tip you know I got last year was a blue kitchen sponge. So, and you know, that, that blew my mind when buddy told me to take that on the goat hunt. And I was just, I was really impressed with how good that worked. I find the thing that's helped me the most is make sure you have a tent that has a good ventilation system in the top corners of the tent. Yeah. Okay. Now round dome tents typically don't work as well. I've, I went and I see you were using it too. I really like the Hilleberg tents. Yeah. I think they're the best tent made out there. I agree. Most of those Hilleberg tents, if you grab the right ones, not the solo, it's not the best at it, but there's a couple of the other ones there that have really good ventilation in the top corners of it. And right. I find that if you can keep them open, where a lot of that air would disappear through the top. Now, the drawback is you tend to lose a bit of heat doing that too, but it definitely didn't get the condensation, especially on the winter hunts. And I tell guys, you don't realize what you're dealing with 
until you do winter goat hunts. Yeah. And anybody can talk about, oh, I camp in the winter time to this. Go do, you know, Region Six BC winter goat hunts with high humidity and high snow loads and stuff. You want to see what wet is? You'll see Oof. what wet is. Try and get fires and stuff going. That's impossible. The one thing I seen there, I I seen you get a fire going that you kind of struggle with it. And I was just curious to know, did you dig down? You go to the base of them cedar trees and you dig down about through three feet of needles. I didn't dig as deep as I should have. And that's what ended up screwing me in the end. It, it put itself yeah. out because it just melted it into the snow and I know better. And that's what yeah. I that Yeah. No, screwed that up. You get in them great big trees, you get into the base of them, dig down about three feet and it's all needles. It's soft. Right. You can dig down through that stuff and you will find dry wood down there. It's crazy. Yeah. And if it's not dry, it's got kind of a, uh, it's breaking down, but if you just leave it sitting outside just for a little bit, it's amazing how fast it does dry. And that wood there, you can actually light it on fire and you can actually burn some stuff. Yeah. That's, so, a, good, that's a good tip. Um, yeah. what would you say your three most, yeah. like if you were going to give somebody a recommendation, what's the three most imp- important pieces of gear for a sheep hunt? Backpack, backpack, backpack. <laughs> I like it. <laughs> no, I would say probably, I mean, you got to have a good pack. If you're not running a good pack, you're in trouble. Um, and you got to have good boots. Yeah. Those two things are key. You know, I, 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 there's a lot of different things. I love my optics. Don't get me wrong. But if I had to short on something, if I was sitting there as a first time sheep hunter and I had to short on something, it would probably be my rifle scope and my binoculars. I would definitely have a really good spotting scope because that saves me miles and miles and miles. That would be the most important piece that I would buy. Okay. There's a lot of guys that feel differently. I want better binoculars, this, that, because I spend more time with them. But I find when I'm sheep hunting, I tend to grid pattern with that spot and scope probably more than I even do with my binoculars. And I find more with it. Interesting. So I find it way more important for me to have a good spotting scope. And then when I glass the spotting scope, a trick that I've learned over the years is I don't close my one eye all the time. Sometimes I'll use a hand over it, but most of the time I just keep it open. Huh. I've trained myself over the years. I don't get that eye fatigue simply because I just keep both eyes open. Right. Once I spot something, I'll close that eye so I can get a better look of it. But if I'm just doing my grid patterns and stuff, I just keep both eyes open. A lot of times I'll switch back and forth between eyes too. And some people have a real tough time doing that. But when you start glassing for six, seven, eight hours a day, which is not uncommon when you're sheep hunting, you start learning all kinds of little tricks that are going to help you out. And if you're not doing those little tricks, you're soon going to be doing them. So, but yeah, the footwear, got to have it. You have to, and this is the big key thing. I hear guys out there, they're like, oh, you got to buy these boots. Oh, you got to buy these boots. You got to buy these boots. No, you got to buy the boots that fit your feet. Right. There's certain companies out there. You're a big guy. I'm guessing you got pretty wide feet on you. Oh yeah. Real wide. I have to buy so, wide shoes if they don't fit. Exactly. You, you look at some of the Merrells that are built out oh. there or some of the, they're just not wide enough for no. a guy with wide feet. Whereas, you know, Scarpa makes a really wide boot. Yeah. Um, I've come across some handwags now that are a really wide set of boots. So that's what a guy can get away with. Now, if you take a guy with a real narrow foot, I'm actually not going to recommend a Scarpa to him. The, the way that the, the heel channel and the heel lock is on there, most guys are going to end up rubbing because they got narrow feet. And they do, and they go to walk, it rubs up and down back there. And I've seen guys, they're scarred right up wearing oh, a brand yeah. new pair of Scarpa boots. So, And the next thing I always recommend to guys, as soon as you get them new boots, because I see all the guys, they get their new packs, they get whatever – don't just admire that stuff and keep it all new. As soon as you get them, go out and go fly fishing with it. Go run the creeks for a day. Get those things so they form to your feet. Then put them in the sun and dry them right out. Then go put them on another day and do that same thing all over again and dry them out. Get those things so they form to your feet. Right. I mean, it is so important to do that. You show up with a brand new pair of boots and you're pulling the tag off in camp. Wow. I'm cringing because I'm like, this is not good. You can't be doing this. Wear them boots. Put a backpack on and wear them a bunch before you ever come up. And what you should be doing is wearing them a whole bunch so they're broken in really well before you go sheep hunting. So you can sit there and go, I don't like these, or I do like these. And you start to realize, hey, I can I can definitely hike with these for, you know, my 10 days at a time. I can't tell you how many times I've seen guys, you know, by day three, it's just tenderfoot city. They're going through moleskin like crazy and they're putting stuff on their feet. They're looking at me going, how, how come your feet aren't busted up? One, I got calluses that are so bad it's not even funny from years and years of, of doing it. I never get blisters. But two, I break all my stuff in. I'm smart enough that I go and break this stuff in way ahead of time. I don't show up in camp with a brand new pair of boots going, oh, I hope everything's going to work out real well here because it's not. Yeah, 100%. So, 
Um, and then backpacks, got to have a great backpack. I'm running Kafaru right now. Absolutely love them. If I'm going way deep in, I will use an external frame pack. I use Barney Bob's pack that they have up there. Um, but most of the hunts I'm doing, if it's seven days and under, I'm using the Kafaru. Um, just love the durability of them. Love the form of them. Like how you can change everything up on them to make them fit anybody. I mean, big key to it. And then the weight of the pack to begin with. I mean, some of these packs, you know, that I use 13, 14, 15 pounds before you start putting anything in there. Right. You know, you're going to be running 65, 70 pounds then. Yeah. If you can keep that pack around 10 pounds, you know, and try to keep yourself with about 40 pounds of gear. If you can do that, you're going to be comfortable. If you can hit that 50 pound mark or 55 pound mark, you're going to be comfortable on your hunt. If you start getting in that 60, 65, 70, unless you're a big guy, and I mean 225 and bigger, you're going to, it's going to wear on you. It's going to wear you down. Yeah, for sure. Um, okay. I, uh, I don't want to take too much more of your time here, Clay. Maybe just real quickly. I don't know. What are your guys' plans? Are they going to let you bring people into NWT this year? Like w what's the outlook for you guys? Yeah, actually it's looking really good. We got the green light now. We did some COVID protocol workshops here and everything. And yep. They're going to allow us to bring in Canadians. We're still up in the air whether they're going to allow you know anybody else from around the rest of the world. But we're really excited about the prospect that we get to get back up. We get to go hunting. Um, we got a long list of protocols, you know, no different than anybody else has had to deal with in this whole thing. Ours are probably a little more extensive. Um, I'm a little baffled by some of the rules and regulations because it's far more intensive than what a person has even open up a restaurant. Yeah. You know, and, and it's far more intensive than what Walmart has. And how these big companies get away with doing what they're doing and me with one guy in our own backpack tents in the middle of nowhere is such a threat to society. I haven't quite figured out yet and I'm not sure I ever will. So I'm just grateful for the opportunity to be able to go back out there and get in the mountains again. So, so with that being said, are there, you got opportunities or spots for Canadian, like if anybody's listening to this, are you still looking for guys? Are you guys all booked up? What's the, cause this well, is not that COVID was a good thing, but sold out. I got lots of guys that have said that they were coming, but I'm, I'm just collecting deposits now. Okay. So, I mean, I'm doing it all on a first come first serve basis. So if there's some guys out there that want to go, Get them to reach out to me. I've got a few spots left right now, but if everybody sends their money that said they were going to, I'm probably not going to have any left. But I believe everybody and I believe everything when I have the money in my hand because that's how you know if a guy's actually booked or not. Yeah, and I don't want to say like I mean, there was nothing good about COVID, but it, you know, there was some hunts that Canadians, you know, never would have got a shot at or, or, or got a shot at for a more affordable price than they ever would have before and that, that's what i was telling one guy's like if you were ever thinking about doing a guided hunt like last year and this year like these are the years to do it because you're going to have a better chance of getting in on one that you probably would either encountered a wait list or wouldn't have been able to afford um otherwise just because of the whole you know border border issues well and now they're even saying as of friday you're not even supposed to hunt out of your own region are they're gonna you know put in a fine yeah i just don't know how they're gonna police that nah and i don't think they will like i think the real people out there are not i think they're doing it to just one of these kind of tactics to just try and limit travel and it was like you said with two guys in a backpack i don't see how me going up to prince george by myself to go hunt bears for a week has any impact whatsoever on on anyone no. you know i fill up here don't even need to talk to anybody got my own food like i don't so I, I'm I, having I, a tough time seeing the rational sense behind yeah. watching the UFC a couple nights ago, <laughs> seeing 17,000 screaming fans in the crowd yeah. and not being told we can't go from one zone to the next zone. Yeah. I, I'm just not buying it It's anymore. a bit of a tough pill to swallow, for sure. It is. Yeah. So I might, do I think people are going to listen to it? No. Do I think they can enforce it? They're going to throw out some fines, but you know what? If I've ever seen something that infringes on our charter of rights and freedoms, that's it. Yeah. So 100%. it's time that you know, when it's a true safety measure, Hey, I'm in, I'm all for it. But do I think that, that that's going to make such a big difference and that it's fair right now? No, you can't keep doing this to people. This is the last time I checked, it's still a free country and people have the rights to make decisions. And if you're that scared, if that's what it's about, if it truly is about safety, you know what? Stay home. Don't go out there, but leave the rest of us alone. The yeah. guys that really want to get out there and still live life. We're not going to live in fear. I would, I would way sooner be going out there doing what I love doing and risk it. When we go out in this back country, every time you and I go back there, we are risking not coming home. It's reality. Since yeah. I've started doing this business, I started counting and keeping track when I turned 13 years of age, because that was the first time I remember losing somebody that was really close to me in this business. 
I've lost 31 people now that I know in this business. No shit. So to say it comes with inherent risk is an understatement. But you know what? You want to live or do you just want to go through life? Because I want to live. I want to experience things that nobody else is doing. I want to go experience parts of the world and see things that people only dream of. And once I'm doing those things, I'm happy. That's where my heart and soul is. To put me in a place and say, all you can do is sit around this apartment or go sit at this house and you can't move you know, for the next three years of your life. No, nah, that's not living. I'd sooner take my chances out there. I spent the winter down in Mexico. We were hunting all over the place. We had an unbelievably good time down there. And we got to do a ton of hunting. And it was amazing. Absolutely amazing. Um, don't regret it. Not one bit of it. And plan on going back again this year. So I say to everybody out there, don't believe everything that you're seeing because the rest of the world is not the way Canada is right now. Not shut down the way we are. I, I think that's a perfect note and it couldn't be better any, uh, better said than that. And we'll, we'll wrap up mm -hmm. on that. I want to thank you for your time, Clay. That was phenomenal, man. And uh, that was really, really helpful. So thank you again for taking the time to chat today. I really appreciate it, man. Yeah, no problem at all. I hope you learned something from it. And, you know, if nothing else, I'm always around. Give me a holler. I'm always willing to help people out and give them some tips. And hopefully it leads to a successful hunt. You send me a picture at the end of the year and you go, hey, look what happened. So I got my fingers crossed for you. All right. Thanks again, Clay. All right. Take care. Bye.